Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the second of three panels in our symposium on Afghanistan. Uh, today, we will be discussing the regional implications of the Taliban control of Afghanistan. We have four speakers with expertise and a long history of study and work in the region that we are excited to welcome today. Mr. Sher, Sher Jan Ahmadzai is the director of the Center for Afghanistan Studies at the University of Nebraska at Omaha. He worked with the Afghan government before coming to the United States and served with the Afghanistan Assistance Coordination Agency, then run by former president of Afghanistan, Ashraf Ghani. He later served as the scheduling manager for Pre President Hamid Karzai of Afghanistan. Mr. Altaf Ladakh is the chief executive officer of Roshan, the largest telecom company in Afghanistan. Mr. Ladakh has over 25 years of experience in international marketing and strategic development in the telecom industry. He has also worked with the Aga Khan Fund for Economic Development and Strategic Development to further its telecoms and agribusiness strategy in Central Asia. Dr. Aisha Jalal is a Pakistani American historian who serves as the Mary Richardson Professor of History at Tufts University and was the recipient of the 1998 MacArthur Foundation Fellowship. She is, the, she is the author of several books, including Democracy and Authoritarianism in South Asia and Comparative and Historical Perspective. Dr. Jalal also co-authored Modern South Asia, History, Culture and Political Economy with Shigata Bose. Dr. Oya Dursun Oshkanja is the Endowed Chair of International Studies and a Professor of Political Science at Elizabethtown College. Her research interests include Turkish foreign policy and transatlantic security, and she has authored a book on Turkish relations with the West, which was published in 2019. Thank you all for joining us. And if you have any questions throughout the panel, please send them in the Q&A box to be answered at the end of the discussion. I will now pass it on to our moderator for today's panel, Ravi Patel, who is a junior and on the board of the Tufts Middle East Research Group. Thank you, Walajan, for the introduction. I'd like to thank all of the panelists for taking time out of the busy schedules to come and speak with us this afternoon. We have a diverse and highly knowledgeable group of speakers who will contribute to an excellent discussion on the regional implications of Taliban control. As Arjun mentioned, if anyone in the audience has questions throughout the panel, you can send them in the Zoom Q&A function and we'll get to them in the latter half of the event. Could all of you please briefly describe your work with Afghanistan, South Asia, or any other relevant topics and the reaction to the fall of the Afghan government? if you'd like to begin. Sure, thank you very much, Ravi. Um, and thank you very much for this kind introduction and having me as part of this distinguished panel. Uh, so I will be approaching this from an analysis of Turkish foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis the situation in Afghanistan. And uh, Turkey is a very important NATO ally since 1952. And uh, it, is the, it, it has the second largest uh, military forces in the uh, alliance after uh, the United States, uh, and it is it has the only majority Muslim population within the alliance as well. And uh, Turkey has been very, uh, very much involved uh, in the military and uh, diplomatic uh, interventions in Afghanistan ever since 2001 as part of the NATO mission uh, and has maintained 500 uh, personnel, um, non-combat um, uh, personnel uh, in the field in Afghanistan since 2001. And in the last six years, Turkey has been um, uh, responsible for maintaining the military wing of the uh, airport in Kabul. And uh, as a result of uh, its really uh, strong uh, soft power in Afghanistan, uh, as it uh, really enjoys quite a um, good amount of goodwill uh, from among the different um, ethnic uh, communities communities in Afghanistan, uh, it has uh, been rarely a target of any um, um, military attacks uh, in the um, uh, years since 2001. And ever since the fall of the um, um, Afghan government and uh, taking of control of the Taliban um, uh, in Afghanistan, uh, Turkey has been trying to position itself very centrally uh, in terms of uh, maintaining the 
uh, and running the logistic of operations in the uh, Kabul airport. So uh, Turkey has been in negotiations with the Taliban uh, regime as well as uh, with Qatar and uh, to a certain extent Pakistan in terms of um, running the Kabul airport, which really uh, re represents a very important uh, strategic uh, position uh, for both the Taliban government and also for the international community's involvement uh, in the uh, region, uh, because it's a gateway for the uh, Taliban uh, regime uh, for its access to the outside world and also for the flow of uh, international aid. It will prove to be a very significant and strategic strategic uh, location uh, for uh, for the country. So Turkey has been really uh, trying to uh, position itself uh, very strongly to uh, run, uh, run the uh, airport. And um, Turkish authorities and uh, Taliban has been in the last couple of uh, weeks maintaining some high level um, negotiations and uh, political meetings in terms of uh, security, development, capacity building, education, as well as health. Um, and um, like I mentioned, because of the uh, strong uh, soft power that Turkey enjoys in the country, uh, in terms of its relations with uh, its um, close ties with uh, different ethnic and political factions in the country, uh, we are seeing that um, Turkey is really well positioned. And um, on a very important topic uh, that uh, on which I have written quite extensively, um, uh, Turkey has not been enjoying very good relations with its NATO allies, uh, as I have uh, attributed a significant number of chapters in my um, uh, first book that I published two years ago. And um, uh, Turkey has uh, purchased S-400 uh, missile defense systems from Russia. And uh, as a result of that, it has been uh, a subject uh, to uh, cuts uh, sanctions, countering America's adversaries through sanctions. Act. Um, uh, and uh, so ever since then, Turkey has been really working hard to present itself as a reliable partner for NATO as well as the uh, United States and the rest of the West, Western alliance. So this really Kabul airport presented itself as a great opportunity for the Turkish authorities to position themselves very centrally. And it made uh, strategic sense for the Western allies to support that. And one final note, Note before I end my remarks, um, there is a strong uh, negative public opinion um, in the Turkish public opinion against the refugee flows. And ever since the withdrawal um, of the uh, US and other allies uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan, we have seen about 50,000 uh, Afghan uh, irregular migration and uh, asylum seekers uh, that are uh, coming into uh, Turkey. Uh, Turkey currently has 4 million uh, refugees in the country and the public opinion is very much against that. Uh, mainly Syrian refugees, but uh, considerably now increasing uh, in numbers Afghan uh, refugees as well. So uh, that is presenting a significant challenge for the Turkish government to deal with the situation in a very sensitive sensitive way, and uh, Turkish government has erected a wall uh, in the uh, borders between Turkey and Iran just to, um, you know, prevent the overflow of refugees um, because uh, of the upcoming general elections uh, in Turkey that are coming up very soon in 2023. So um, with that, I would like to uh, put an end to my remarks, but I look forward to the Q&A section. Thank you. Uh, if I can go, should I go next, Ravi? Uh, yes. Hi, uh, good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to be on, on this panel. Um, I'm coming from a business and economic perspective, so I, I will give that view of my thoughts on where we are today in Afghanistan and where we've come from. I actually started working in Afghanistan in 2003, so I've been there for 18 years. Uh, we were awarded the, sec the second mobile telephone license to operate uh, in end of, beginning of 2003 and started operations in, in July. 
We're part of the Aga Khan Fund for Economic Development, which is part of the Aga Khan Development Work Network. So we actually have a social and economic development angle in what we do. So we're not, we're a for-profit agency, but we're there as part of the development of the country as well. Um, I just wanna give you, and, and I think a lot of people hear news about what's going on from a political security perspective, but just to give you a, a perspective a view on how economically the country changed, particularly in the, in the first few years uh, of the government uh, being in power with uh, Karzai. From the telecom sector, telecoms was probably the first success story of private sector development and investment. And there are four major operators apart from ourselves. One is an Afghan American company. The other two, one is Etzlat, which is the UAE's national provider and very strong in the region and also MTN from South Africa. So again, two very large, powerful companies in this region. Just to give you an idea of the investments that have been made in Afghanistan since 2003, and I'm talking from our perspective as Roshan, but if you multiply by four very quickly, you'll, you'll get the orders of magnitude. We have invested $700 million in the country in terms of network development to bring state-of-the-art technology, including 3G, 4G, fiber. We've paid over $700 million in taxes to the government. We've employed directly and indirectly 50,000 people in jobs. Uh, at our peak, we were at 1,200 people, and then all the ancillary support services. And we very much focus on hiring or building partners from the Afghan businessmen who are very uh, entrepreneurial. At the peak in 2012, this industry alone was generating over $1 billion in revenues. Um, so it was really, it's always been touted as one of the success stories of foreign direct investment and private sector development. However, I think since 2012, particularly as you saw the drawdown of the troops, uh, the American troops in particular, there has been a significant decline in economic development in the country. Uh, and this is where I think the government has a role. And it's not just now we're seeing that, but it's actually been over the last 10 years. And what does that mean? As the troops were withdrawn, the security became worse. A lot of your Afghan businessmen left the country and stopped investments. The government was looking to raise taxes. The taxes, they came after private sector companies and telecoms was the only private sector company they could target. Today, we pay more than 50% of revenues in taxes to the government, which means we can't invest in the country. We have become, as we say, it's, it's milking the cow, uh, but that has stopped further investments in the country. What has also happened, as we all know, is there's been a lot of corruption in the country, and that has also led us to, uh, has impacted our investments as we've grown because we've had to deal with a lot of political issues. And why I'm bringing all of this up is that this is, this is the role of the government in a country that was very fragile with let, lack of infrastructure. When we started, 30,000, 50,000 people had access to a phone. Today, it's 25 million people. And the role of private sector, the role of the government, the role of the international governments is to work together to drive infrastructure development. And I think the government and the international governments together have failed to do that over the last 10 years. So we're at an interesting point of time where what, what happens now? This is a country that is very rich in terms of uh, minerals, $1 trillion plus of minerals, has a lot of opportunities. It has agriculture that can be exported. Um, <clears throat> and there's a role for government to play. I'm not saying I endorse the new government or the last government, but the role of the government today is critical. And I think the role of the international community is also very important to provide not just humanitarian aid, but also economic development and to support the, the government today in terms of what the potential is of the country. Thank you. Thank you. Charlotte John, if you'd like to go next. Ravi, thank you very much. Uh, appreciate um, your invitation and being part of this wonderful panel discussing Afghanistan and developments in Afghanistan, especially in the background of recent developments that um, happened to be a regime change, historical event in the history of Afghanistan for the last many years, especially when the United States was there for 20 years. This happens to be a significant 
change the Afghans and international community have experienced. This change um, has not only directly affected the people that are inside Afghanistan, but also affected the people around Afghanistan. My take would be how these changes have affected the citizens of Afghanistan, men and women, children and elderly. And what do we see as the political future for the people uh, in and around Afghanistan? The dynamics that are in play or at play in terms of regional connectivity, regional um, effects, implications of what happened in Afghanistan for the Afghan neighbors and the great powers in the region. There has been a power struggle by all great nations and the smaller nations around Afghanistan at what they could get out of Afghanistan uh, for the reasons every country has in their national security aspect. My work in the past government in Afghanistan under President Karzai before 2007 was an experience that gave me an opportunity to look into the country itself, how the country was ruled or served uh, in different capacities and what it mattered for the Afghans when it, they came out of a relatively different and darker era of Taliban, the Taliban 1.0 in 1990s. Uh, now we see Taliban 2.0 there were expectations that after what the United States did with Taliban in Doha, uh, everybody was expecting that a new Taliban, a changed Taliban would come and provide Afghanistan a different path. Uh, the definition of difference is relevant to who you're talking to, but it is definitely different than what we had a month and a half ago. Now that happens to be the responsibility of the new people in the government in Afghanistan, what course of action and policy they choose for Afghanistan that would affect uh, the economic growth of Afghanistan that has been there for the last 20 years. Uh, the social growth in Afghanistan and the political growth in Afghanistan that has been there for the last 20 years. In the last 100 years of history of Afghanistan, the last 20 years were, were, were significant, uh, significantly different in terms of engagement. Uh, we have had the Soviet Union in Afghanistan, but that was one big country. But the last 20 years, we had more than 40 countries in Afghanistan, in the national coalition that brought in with itself a lot of opportunities and as well as challenges uh, for the country itself and for the region itself. The withdrawal that happened and the way it happened has created a vacuum that is not going to be filled uh, neither by Taliban nor China nor Pakistan nor any other country. The economic assistance the United States offered to Afghanistan uh, was so huge that if you look at the economic activity for the last many years, um, that nobody can fill in that gap. Now, Afghanistan needs to do a reality check. The Afghan neighbors need to do a reality check. What is required of Afghanistan and what is needed in Afghanistan? The people in Afghanistan have seen a different generation grow, uh, born and grow after 9-11. This is not a generation of the 90s. This is a generation more savvy, uh, more educated, more uh, traveled around the world. This is a generation of Zoom. This is a generation of technology like Althaf talked about, where thousands of millions of people have access to phones. Different telecom companies are there. They have closer access to the world. They know what's happening in any corner of the world. They know what's happening at Tufts. They know about Tuft. They do not know about Tufts in, in, in 1990. Uh, companies like Roshan, Afghan uh, Wireless, and many others have, have been part of this development. We cannot neglect the fact that we just switch off uh, um, the power to these companies, nothing will happen. No, this is a new generation. We witnessed uh, Afghani youngsters who were not born on 9-11 uh, demonstrating against uh, removing the national flag of Afghanistan by Taliban soldiers in different provinces of Afghanistan. That says a lot about how changed Afghanistan is and their need for reality check is by the current administrators in Afghanistan is they have to face what the Afghan people demand. And that has happened, this whole education, the whole social education that you see, the change that you see is because of the international involvement in Afghanistan that we cannot uh, take for granted because it was not just a one-sided thing. It was uh, demand and supply. The Afghan people needed that education and they got it. Thousands and millions of Afghan students went abroad and educated and came back. And they're now in Afghanistan with different mindset not that of Taliban, not that of the Taliban of the 1990s or the civil war era or the era of 80s. 
it's a way different different uh, education and it's a way different generation of the Afghans. So uh, we need to do a reality check. Uh, and of course, the neighbors of Afghanistan do need to do the reality check. When we claim that Afghanistan, it depends who, how you define graveyard of the empires, that Afghanistan is the graveyard of the empires, I consider it is, it's the graveyard of the Afghans themselves. Uh, Afghans, Afghans have the victim of that one. And when we say Russia, Soviet, uh, Soviet Union, uh, the Brits, the Americans, as some people say, have been defeated in Afghanistan. Uh, uh, no great power could survive in Afghanistan. Then why would you think a smaller power would survive in Afghanistan? Be that Pakistan, be that Iran, be that um, any country from Central Asia. Why would we think the dynamics of Afghanistan would play well uh, if they are involved instead of these great powers? The dynamics of Afghanistan are so complex, at the same time, so easy if you want to look at it from a different angle, um, then, then we would understand what Afghanistan is going through and how we can address some of the issues that Afghans and Afghanistan have gone through and how the region itself, the neighbors have to deal with this one. Uh, let's, we, we have a saying in the United States, so whatever happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. That's not the case in Afghanistan. Whatever ha happens in Afghanistan does not stay in Afghanistan. We have seen this in the past. Afghanistan was a prosperous country in the 40s. The whole region was better. In the 40s and 60s, 50s and 60s, Afghanistan was one of the countries with constitutional demo uh, democracy or uh, monarchy. There was a constitution, there was a national assembly, there were elections. Women of Afghanistan had the right to vote. Countries around Afghanistan not. In the 1970s, uh, for example, uh, Pakistan, Iran, Central Asia, China were under the dictatorial system of governance, be that communist or non-governments or religious, but Afghanistan had a system that was built in a constitution supported by the people of Afghanistan. So those developments happened and then the dark era came by the Soviet invasion in Afghanistan. What it brought to Afghanistan affected the whole region. What happened in Pakistan and the United States getting involved in the 80s against Soviet Union. And what happened after the United States withdrew and uh, another vacuum was created, we saw that a 9-11 happened. So that's why I say what happened in Afghanistan does not stay in Afghanistan. And we have to understand, it's very important for us to, to know what Afghanistan can be. And, and we, as a single country, whoever is small or big country that we cannot deal with Afghanistan, let's let it, the Afghans uh, be the owners of their affairs. When we say that great powers failed, I mean, it would be uh, wrong to believe a smaller power could be victorious in Afghanistan. So I would, I would be glad to answer any questions on this. Uh, looking forward to the questions. Thank you. Thank you. Professor Jalal, if you'd like to take your Well, thank you. Um, while it's still, I think, far too early to predict how the Taliban takeover in Afghanistan will impact the region situation, uh, I think it's possible to anticipate some likely scenarios. The first, and one that I hope will not uh, occur, uh, is uh, the possibility of the regional actors working at cross purposes, which they have been for decades, uh, and continuing to do so with one uh, I mean, wanting to fight a proxy war, uh, something that, that they've also been doing in Afghanistan, uh, which will have dire consequences for an already fragile uh, political uh, situation and not to mention uh, a very precarious economic situation. This would happen if uh, India, let's say, uh, for instance, finds the change in Afghanistan unacceptable for its uh, strategic uh, interests. India has um, invested a great deal in Afghanistan over the last a uh, couple of decades. Um, and so, I mean, with or without US, uh, it may be tempted um, to try and forestall with the help of its, uh, with its uh, supporters uh, and its allies in Afghanistan, the formation of a stable government uh, under the Taliban. I mean, it, India doesn't have to do anything and the Taliban might yet fail because there's no certainty that they can even control their own rank and file. But nevertheless, external intervention is not gonna ha help matters. Uh, in such circumstances, uh, if there is a proxy war, one can uh, expect to see chaos compounded uh, with especially detrimental consequences along the Pakistan-Afghan border, uh, as well as, uh, it has to be said, the Central Asian uh, states, uh, which will be very, very badly affected. Um, and so one, because we could witness uh, increased activity by Taliban allied anti-state uh, militants like the uh, Tehreek-e Taliban Pakistan, uh, while the ISIS-K uh, tries creating havoc in Afghanistan and from there beyond. Um, if a proxy war by competing regional powers can be prevented, 
then I think the current efforts um, uh, by Russia, China, Iran, and Pakistan may well possibly have some chance to keep the extremism of the Taliban in check um, by keeping them engaged with the international community. This is of the essence because this is the only way to avoid a repeat of the 1990s when an isolated and frustrated Taliban government flouted all norms of global engagement once it became clear that they were not going to be welcome as a member of the international community. The international community would also for its part have to strike um, just the right balance between uh, their distaste and fear of the Taliban and the need to have some modicum of order in Afghanistan. The Taliban need international recognition and the people of Afghanistan above everyone else need humanitarian considerations. Uh, the Taliban are desperately in need of funds, uh, a need that should be used um, to extract concessions from them, even if there is no certainty that they can eventually deliver on their promises given the divergent attitudes of their rank and file and the various sort of groups within. Uh, if the Taliban fail, unfortunately, there'll be another round of hostilities before an alternative configuration can even emerge. Uh, the costs for Afghanistan and the regional neighbors will be colossal. Uh, there will be waves of displaced Afghans waiting to pour into uh, Iran uh, and Pakistan. Uh, both of which, uh, uh, for some of you who might not know, host uh, between, I mean, Iran has 780,000 uh, refugees from Afghanistan, and Pakistan has some 1.5 million Afghan refugees. Um, mm -hmm. Until the 1980s, unlike the 1980s, when there was, there was ample international funding for these refugees, the sources have now, now dried up. Uh, and so there's no desire on the part of the regional um, neighborhood, uh, with the possible exception of uh, Afghanistan uh, to, to take these uh, uh, refugees. Um, so I think that's of some significance. I mean, Iran has already threatened, uh, said that it will send them back when the times, the situation in Afghanistan is, is right, uh, right uh, and Pakistan has threatened uh, to, to close borders. I think it's also quite significant that Pakistan um, has withheld recognition uh, from the Taliban. Uh, and seems to be indicating its intention to do so in concert with other regional countries. Um, whether this signals a different tactic on the part of Pakistan remains to be seen. Um, while the oldest, I mean, will the old distinction, for instance, between good and bad Taliban hold for Pakistan uh, now that the TTP with its with its allies or uh, Taliban in power? I mean, you know, will, it, will, will, will that change Pakistan's attitude uh, and, and its long drawn distinction? Uh, the outcome is very uncertain. It all really depends on what lessons, if any, have been learned from this forever war um, um, and whether peace is really considered to be the interests of the, of the concerned parties. I think I would question that as well. I mean, obviously at one level, one would like to say that peace is, uh, there is there, there can be peace, which is, uh, you know, win-win for all. And that's the kind of peace, that's the only kind of peace I see working. Uh, recent history sadly does not give us cause for optimism. If Afghanistan descends into a fresh bout of civil war, uh, we can expect to see heightened Taliban-related violence in neighboring Pakistan, uh, a surge in foreign terrorist <clears throat> fighters with grave consequences for Pakistan as well as for Iran and cent the Central Asian countries, the whole region. Uh, this will be especially concerning from a regional security point of view, because even if the Taliban are not concerned about spreading their brand of Islam globally, their admirers in countries like Pakistan and also in some countries in Central Asia see their success as an overture to what they could try achieving in their own countries. I think this is something that has to be taken account of very seriously as one of the regional implications. It will take concerted effort and constant vigilance by states in the region to ensure that their security and stability is not held ransom. Uh, to the uncertain and high, highly volatile situation that has been created with the American withdrawal in Afghanistan. Thank you. Thank you all. To begin, I'd like to ask about the Taliban on a global stage. As we've seen in the past few days, the Taliban is attempting to achieve diplomatic recognition via seat on the UN General Assembly. How will the Taliban engage in a global stage, whether it be in international institutions or in commerce and business? How will actors such as multinational corporations and states react to the Taliban's wishes for legitimacy? I'll talk if you'd like to begin. Well, at one level, Ravi, I think this has already been going on for a while. I mean, the Americans took the, the lead in this. Uh, so I don't think it's something unusual. It's a question of further 
furthering those negotiations and, and, and having the, the different kinds of discussions, but it's not as if it hasn't, is not being done. Correct. And I think, I mean, my view is the government is, is an instrumental part of, in, of the development of the country and, and, the, and in a country like Afghanistan, which is still a very fragile state and has been declining in development over the last 10 years, which, which was the point I was trying to make. What we saw in the, if you look at the last 20 years, the first 10 years, a country that had nothing started to see development, there started to be a positivity and, and that has all reversed in the last 10 years. Businessmen are leaving, businessmen have stopped investing, telecoms have stopped investing, two of the operators are looking to exit the country. So I think it's very important that the government is recognized also, it has to be supported at the international level. And if it isn't, then I think you risk losing any grounds that have been made. And I think Shahjan, Shahjan said, this is Taliban 2.0. What they have said to us as we've had meetings with them in the countries is they've said the right things. We're pro private sector development. We're pro infrastructure development. We're pro women working. We're pro education. We want to be legitimized and we want to see development in the country. And the country has a lot of potential. My personal view is that the way the withdrawal was done, the way the, the gov international governments are working today is yes, there could be a carrot and stick approach to try and say you do this and they should, right? But it's actually given them more power in my view of being able to have these factions in their government. And it's very important that the international government works together with the Taliban or the new government in whatever structure it is to try and find that legitimacy and to try and find the structures and the support that needed. I, I don't believe that they can do this on their own. I don't see that they have the, the necessary capabilities. And if nothing is done soon, we're gonna see the country go further in decline and eventually back to the way it was. I would have a, a little bit of a different look at this situation. There is no doubt in any country, there are two main players the public, the people of that country that are supposed to be served and the government of that country that needs to provide policy and framework for those people and their counterparts out of that country. Afghanistan in the last 20 years had a framework, had a structure that is no longer there. That was designed, helped and established by the deep involvement of the international community and this international community involved all Afghan neighbors. That is no more there. The investments of billions of dollars by Roshan, AWCC, and many other companies, for example, are the result of those policies. Yes, Afghanistan was too small to invest billions and billions of dollars that resulted in vast corruption. There is no doubt on that one. But it did result in a framework and a structure that could have been sustained for a broader future development, not for letting businesses escape because of whatever reason they might have. Of course, the insecurity, the corruption, those were major reasons why businesses are getting out of Afghanistan. But more importantly, uh, coming down to the question of legitimacy for any government, if we let um, international community, let any organization uh, topple one government uh, and get another one and still be recognized by international community. Actually, we are encouraging a wrong and bad behavior around the world. Any government should first seek its legitimacy from its people, not international community first. Uh, it's important. That's why international community, especially in the West that we are teaching in these universities, when we talk about my first right is my first amendment, I have to speak and I have to also to elect my leaders. When we believe in these, in these rules and these, in these rights, let's also project these rules to the people of Afghanistan. When we say there should be a legitimate government that is, un, uh, that is recognized by the people of Afghanistan, not just the, the Americans or international community. So that should be the first thing that we say. We always promote democracy. Democracy, not the Western value as the uh, Taliban would define it, but democracy that is compatible to the values of the people of that country. In every country, there are universal values of uh, principles of democracy that are accepted. Afghanistan is not uh, 
and, and exclusion, excluded of those things. There are mechanisms traditionally in the systems of Afghanistan, in traditional systems in Afghanistan. Uh, we should push for uh, international recognition. There is no doubt for the sake of the Afghans. And the Afghan government of the future must first gain its legitimacy from its own people, not from us. Uh, those are some conditions. You know, it's a foregone conclusion. We said we can, we can, we can not change a regime. We, we can change a regime or not. But it's already changed by um, in, in, including Taliban in a, in a dialogue that was one-sided, that was always full of uh, giving Taliban more than asking them for more. Actually, uh, that was always at the cost of the very government that national community supported by blood and treasure in the last twenty years. Now we have come to a, a different conclusion. Um, what, what, I, what I believe in is prioritizing the people of Afghanistan and making the people of Afghanistan benefit from our engagement in Afghanistan rather than a group that is unelected and came by force. Would, uh, keeping engaged is absolute necessity, but that engagement should not result in emboldening the bad behavior of the players. Yes, and I think that uh, on that point, you know, I think this Taliban 2.0 is cognizant of the fact that they have to do certain things and act in a certain way to receive the aid from the international community for their own survival, not out of the goodness of their hearts, but for their own survival. And perhaps it's a very key point uh, for the international community's reaction to the situation that perhaps a condition of an internal peace process, a transitional justice process of some sorts is desperately needed in order for, uh, for uh, for the situation to move forward in a peaceful manner, in a very uh, compromise-based uh, manner as well. So, yeah. I would next like to ask about India and Pakistan. How important is the relationship between the Taliban and Pakistan? Will Pakistan seek to carve an ally out of the Taliban regime, or will they conflict over disputes in Pashtunistan and with the TTP? Additionally, how will the Taliban takeover will impact the India-Pakistan relationship? Professor Jalal, if you could begin. Well, I mean, India-Pakistan relationships are already on the ropes uh, because of Kashmir. So Afghanistan simply does, is just another layer uh, adding to the tension. I mean, you know, the, in the Pakistani military establishment, which rules the roost in Pakistan, uh, uh, there is an intrinsic connection uh, uh, between uh, Afghanistan and Kashmir. Uh, so I think you have to recognize that uh, uh, if uh, uh, the situation uh, in Afghanistan slips further, at this stage, the Pakistan, uh, I mean, you know, there, there, there is no uh, real dialogue between the two. Um, and clearly, uh, India sees this as a loss uh, because India has invested in, in, in um, Afghanistan a great deal in infrastructure and otherwise it was a backer of the uh, Ashraf Ghani government. Uh, and so, I mean, you know, the question is, we have to see how the two play themselves out. I mean, their relationship in Kashmir is so dire that I don't see how that uh, will not play itself out in Afghanistan in the future. So I uh, fear that that will be a problem. But the fact that Pakistan currently is working with Russia and China and Iran give some cause of hope, uh, not too much hope, uh, but some hope. Um, and so I was, I mean, my first sort of concern is that another proxy war will be somehow avoided. I'm still not hopeful enough about the ability of the Taliban to pull it together. I think there's a distinction between those who have been the field commanders and those who've been negotiating with the international community, a huge difference of attitude. And so promises made to the international community may well be difficult to translate into practice. On top of it, if, if uh, the Pakistani handlers of some of the Taliban also have a role and a dislike for what is being imposed, uh, then things could get difficult uh, in implementation. So I do think that we need to keep the complexity of the situation in mind, not hope for too much, uh, I think there's a tendency to let your expectations and preferences get the better of you. I think you have to look at the situation on the ground and what is achievable. I think it's, a, I mean, if America couldn't achieve it for 20 years, to expect any government, far less uh, the Taliban, to achieve it is, 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 is colossal. Well, I think um, I'm going to discuss a, a number of, of things here um, in response to your question is Taliban and Pakistan and Pakistan and India. Dr. Jalal really will orchestrate it, that the, 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 the problem between Pakistan and India, the Kashmir has been since 1947. There is no doubt everybody knows that. 
Uh, that's going to maintain, and that's going to be like that forever. I don't see the reason why I say forever because we've not seen the solution for the last 72 years, and the next 72 years are not going to give us a good idea if they're going to solve the problem, unless there is a miracle <laughs> that happens between Pakistan and India, and they really form uh, a good relationship. Um, that, that's one part of, from my perspective, why Pakistan and India have had this problem. The other part is uh, of this whole uh, dilemma is how Pakistan sees Afghanistan itself, excluding India. There, there is no, 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 no doubt that Pakistan always, uh, in many cases, have looked at Afghanistan through the Indian prism, the India phobia that has been present since the birth of Pakistan, unfortunately, has also caused its relationship with its neighbors, especially Afghanistan, because it has historical relationship with India even before Pakistan was not there. On top of that, uh, there is also um, a question um, of the cultural identity in the connection between the people of Afghanistan and Pakistan. Pakistan has a significant population of Pashtuns in the Baluch who uh, naturally, uh, I don't say, I don't claim, I cannot claim that they would opt for citizenship of Afghanistan or no, they can never do that because Pakistan, they're better off in Pakistan than Afghanistan, who naturally came claim for an identity inside of Afghanistan. Uh, that is ethnic identity inside Afghanistan. That is scaring Pakistan of, of such a move, which could be repetition of the uh, 1970s of Bangladesh. If there is not ethnic identity that is not contained within the, the geographic limits of Pakistan. That is one part why there is there are twofold policies of, of Pakistan towards Afghanistan. One is the Indian, India phobia, India sandwiching Pakistan, and one is the identity crisis that have been seen. I lived in Pakistan for 20 years. I grew up there actually. So my life there and understanding the Pashtun and the Baluch population of Afghanistan who've always looked for their historical identity inside of Afghanistan, not Pakistan. That is a, a, a scared note when we see 1971 Bangladesh uh, becoming a separate country, uh, a scaring. When, when, we, when we see the Islamization of the, of the Pakistani society on superimposing this, that identity of we are only Muslims, that tells you a lot about how some policymakers, especially the military, is really scared of any ethnic identity that could that could supersede any other thing. That's from my perspective. Uh, I'm going to give you one example of how reactionary this approach has been toward Pakistan, uh, towards Afghanistan for Pakistan. Uh, before uh, 2002, Pakistan did not have a designated channel, TV channel for the Pashtun population. Everything was done through uh, PTV and it has a six o'clock uh, regional news, Alakai Khabre, and you would sit and watch that one. But after 2002, they it started the Khyber ATV uh, uh, channel for, for, for Afghanistan, specific in Pashto. Why there was no need felt before that, Af but felt after a Pashtun government in Afghanistan was there and we see a reactionary approach. And then a lot of other stuff under Musharraf came up. Uh, uh, so that there's, there's, a, there's a worry behind uh, among the Pakistani establishing policy makers against the ethnic identity that prevails in, a, in, in Pakistan and this identity crisis. Uh, uh, we, we had this Arab identity uh, in, in, the, in the 60s under Ayub Khan or others in Pakistan, we have to know Arabic uh, and because we're Muslim nations and blah, blah, blah. And then recently we have the Turkish identity. We have to watch Turkish soap operas and we are Muslim, we're closer to Turkey and, and all those. That tells you a lot about this, uh, this uneasiness uh, of, of identity itself. And, and if we look at it from, from anthropological view, that gives you different opinion of how those things have, have come up to present itself in terms of their foreign policy uh, with the neighbors. Uh, well, there have been worries of Pashtunistan that has been a thorn, thorny topic in Afghanistan and Pakistan relationship. There has been a topic of the Buran line, which has been a thorny topic between relations of Pakistan and Afghanistan, which is gonna stick with the Pakistani policymakers forever. And that's why the Islamization of identity has always been there. That's why the superimposing of Islamization of identity, whatever, whatever it came from uh, uh, there, the Islamic revolution of Afghanistan in 1970, since 1973 has been supported by circles uh, under uh, Prime Minister Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto, even till now um, uh, when we see it. Uh, I always ask one question from, from, uh, from my fellows in, in, in academia and in, in, in everywhere else. Uh, they say Taliban are indigenous movement who can, yes, they might have indigenous characteristics. Uh, they toppled the government of Afghanistan, the national community was tired getting out of Afghanistan. But one question I ask, do you think 
Taliban could have done all of this without the support they got from Pakistan? That would answer a lot of questions uh, from, from different perspectives. So, so depending on how you look at Afghanistan, uh, it's the internal dynamics that are, that are designing the foreign policy of a country, especially in the case of Pakistan. If, the, if there is a balance, if there is, uh, if, if, if there is a strong identity uh, that could, Pakistanis could play on that one and, and live on that one, I don't think they should be worried about others. Uh, they have nuclear bombs. Why should they should be worried about Afghanistan or India? That's a strong deterrent policy. Uh, but I do think that Mr. Amazay's, um, Dr. Amazay's position is rather simplistic on Pakistan. I just don't agree with what you're saying uh, for the most part, largely because I don't think you account for the extent to which a good chunk of the Pakhtuns are incorporated into the state of Pakistan. That's I what I, no, that, I agree. No, no, I mean, I, I think you present it as a threat by the, I mean, the point is that the Pakistani state is a military dominated state. Uh, it has uh, the most reliable Taliban Khan, uh, as they say, uh, working for them. So they're not worried about that. At this stage, they, are, they were always worried about India. Uh, uh, and I do agree with you that this was of concern, uh, uh, which got revived at the time of the Saw Revolution. But there have been moments, I think it's a much more, I think you'll have to take a nuanced approach to it, uh, uh, rather than to say that this is the primary reason. I think it's India. It's a primary, I mean, on Afghanistan, the army calls the shots and it's an India focused um, concern. So I agree with you there, but I, I think that this, I mean, many of the uh, army guys are, 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 are Pakhtun themselves. And so they have a different vision. So I think that, that, that that's become a little bit more complicated, but clearly I, I think where I disagree with you is your, your analysis, which says that Pakistan's intervention is the primary cause of Afghanistan's uh, disrepair but that American intervention was not, uh, and that American intervention was actually good. And, and, they, and, and the point is that that intervention and what was sought to be achieved in 20 years collapsed because of the nature in which it, that intervention occurred. So I think you need to consider what was done wrong in that intervention, uh, because clearly you are again asking for international support, but I think there needs to be some circumspection of what was done wrong. If it was all done perfectly, how do you explain this collapse, this spectacular collapse? Absolutely. I, I did not compare the interventions of the United States. I was just focusing on one part of the, of the dynamics. There is no doubt the American intervention was unfortunately half-hearted. Uh, if you look at the Bonn conference, uh, Taliban were unnecessarily not part of that equation. They must have, I mean, they should have been there, present in Germany, talking with them. Taliban approached the Afghan government in 2003 and many in 2005 when I was in Afghanistan, uh, they actually were surrendering. The United States did not let that happen. That's a different dynamic. I'm not talking about comparing the US intervention, how, uh, which happens to be after in the 80s and um, in, then in, in 2000. Uh, but overall, as neighbors, uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan have no other option but to live. It's no, absolutely the there is, out. but there is a problem that I've been pointing to, which the international community led by America and under Indian pressure wants to, wants to deny Pakistan, which is that they have been concerned in the, in the security paradigm, Afghanistan is related to Kashmir, but the no move, uh, no, 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 no sort of mention of Kashmir policy does not work. It doesn't help Afghanistan since Afghanistan is such good friends with India or was the previous government. I mean, they should have moved them towards some sort of a resolution because it's come to the point where it's getting untenable. So I think that's the problem. I mean, you can't expect the ordinary people of Pakistan to do anything in a military dominated state. I mean, they might be allowed to vote, but they don't have much say in defense policy. So I think this did require some mediational role by the United States and also by the international community. Maybe the, the Pakistan's friends, the Turks can do something that none of the others can do have been able to do maybe china but i do think you need a different tactic uh, even if you think that they're wrong we need to do something about it you can't have this uh, festering sore of kashmir and then expect a dramatic change of attitude on the part of the park army towards afghanistan well, i think that we are caught in a in a in a in a in a, in a real twist because of this absolutely i mean uh, kashmir okay. has been the issue uh, i was not uh, discounting that part but i was actually I adding and explaining another component to the argument i'm sorry this is cutting off but we're running low on time uh, thank you uh, well thank you very much for the audience q a sure. uh, if you're on zoom you can continue to send questions via the q a function 
And if you're in Cabot, please send your questions to Catalina. Um, we have one question from Ian, who is in Cabot uh, and is directed towards Altaf. He asked, how will Afghanistan's resource wealth affect foreign countries' economic and trade policies towards the Taliban government? You mentioned that Afghanistan has up to $1 trillion in natural resources. And if you could please keep your answer succinct, that would be ideal. Sorry, could you just repeat the first part of the question you, you cut out? Yeah. Um, how will Afghanistan's resource wealth affect foreign countries' economic and trade policies towards the Taliban government? You mentioned that, the, that Afghanistan is sitting on up to $1 trillion in natural resource wealth. I, I'm sorry, I can't get the first, you're cutting out on the first. Yeah. Uh, the I, trade can in, yeah. I can type it in the chat and send it to you, I apologize. How is he, he wanted to know how the, uh, the, the wealth, the natural wealth of Afghanistan will impact the foreign policy by Taliban. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, th I think, as, as I've said, is I think there's a lot, the opportunity, I, where it's going to play out is who comes in to Afghanistan from the regional powers. Uh, there's a lot of aid required, a lot of money required for the economic development. And I think this is going to open up the door for China to come in because they're, as a, a new regional player in Afghanistan, they have been uh, cozying up to the new government quite, uh, quite recently and are seen as a positive influence. They have a lot of money and they're gonna bring that money into the country. The Chinese have been very, they actually had the concessions for the mining sector a few years ago and started to develop the mining sector. What happened was due to the security, secure, insecurity, and they were targeted, they actually left um, and stopped those, the, the mining industry from growing. My, our view is that they, that's one of the areas they're gonna come into and start developing and become a critical player in, in Afghan uh, policy making as well, and how the government is seen. And I think that'll change. And I, I think my colleagues are more uh, understanding of the political situation will change the dynamics quite significantly over the next few years. Thank you. And we have one final question for Oya. What does Turkey seek to gain from its limited engagement in Afghanistan, such as the protection of the Kabul airport and cooperation with Pakistan to assuage the refugee crisis? How will other South Asian states react to Turkey's aims to spread its influence in Afghanistan? I think that Turkey is trying to use this as a um, as a way for its economic gain because the Turkish uh, economy is really uh, experiencing a very uh, difficult bottleneck right now, and um, you know Turkish uh, lira really lost much of its uh, value vis-a-vis -vis the U.S. dollar just. Uh, today, actually, uh, because of the recently announced uh, fiscal policies um, uh, of the um, of the Turkish economic authority. So um, what we are seeing is I think Turkish uh, construction sector would really benefit uh, directly with Turkey's uh, greater involvement in the uh, reconstruction um, um, in the uh, Taliban era uh, in Afghanistan. So um, there is some sort of an uh, economic gain that the Turkish authorities are uh, anticipating from their direct involvement there, uh, I think. And and also the flow of Turkish goods um, and service sector uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan is another anticipated uh, gain uh, from uh, a greater role that can be played by Turkey in, uh, in the country. Thank you. It looks like that is all the time we have for questions today. Would all of you like to make a short one minute closing statement? Uh, Professor Jalal, if you could begin. Yes, well, I mean, I can only hope that uh, we have learned some lessons. I know we haven't learned all the lessons of history, uh, but I would hope that the, the, the regional actors um, and even uh, the, the players within Afghanistan have learned and that peace should be given a chance uh, and, and we should move towards a win-win situation for everyone. So everyone has a stake in the peace and prosperity of the people of Afghanistan. Enough is enough. Uh, and I also think uh, that Pakistan, uh, uh, certainly the people of Pakistan have also paid a very heavy price. And I think that the military establishment there uh, should be 
uh, engaged with by the international community uh, to try and find some sort of an agreement uh, that will be workable for uh, Taliban and I mean, and at least the people of Pakistan. I, I mean, I, I mean, the Taliban has just become a redu reductive term uh, at this stage. I mean, this is this is an, we need an Afghan government uh, that can deliver for its people, and that's what the Pakistani army, whatever, if they have role. I mean, we hear they do. They should play. They, their influence should be used by the international community with some promises vis-a-vis -vis India. So I think this is what is the best hope. But we have to work together. This is not going to work if people start pursuing their own interest in Afghanistan. It will be a disaster, not just for international peace, but for global peace. Afghanistan matters even more today than when the US was in Afghanistan. Piggybacking on Dr. Jalal's word, last words that uh, we have to work on uh, or to be, be constructive, uh, not our, our, our interests. Uh, we this because you say Afghanistan is not the not going to be a problem of itself, but the whole globe, uh, which have, we have seen a lot. If we are allies, then we have to act like allies. We should not be um, be uh, once ally and then trying to uh, to jeopardize the whole process. It should be a win-win game where our global interests should be pr protected rather than interests of a single country or some individual in Afghanistan. Because we have seen this, uh, as they say, um, Afghanistan is the heart of Asia. Actually. It, it sort of proves that if there is no peace in Afghanistan, Iqbal Lahori said that. If there is no peace in Afghanistan, there is no peace in Asia. And that has been seen. If there is no development in Afghanistan, it is not letting connecting the Central Asia with South Asia. And that's a loss for the people of Pakistan, for the people of India, for the people of Central Asia. 1.8 billion people are at loss. So we have to work together for a win-win solution uh, for the interests of all people, uh, and primarily at this moment for the people of Afghanistan. So um, if I could just carry off on, on that, I think I agree with what both uh, panelists have said. I think it's, we're at a very interesting time. And I think there's a difference between now and 20 years ago, where a lot of the youth today have grown up in a non-Taliban era. And, and as Shojan said, they have been used to the latest technology. They're very savvy on social media. Uh, we have what we call the social media activists who pick up on issues and complain about what the government is doing, what the private sector is doing, and looking after the interests of people. So I think we have a, a very different dynamic on the ground. The government has to be looking at how it can do infrastructure development. I think the one thing we are saddened about is the role of women going forward. And I know the next panel is on women. Uh, we had groomed a young Afghan woman to be the CEO of the company, who today she can't. She started off 20 years ago working with us as a receptionist, grew into becoming our HR director, had to move her family out to Tajikistan because she was threatened, and her family was threatened because she, because she had to fire uh, Afghan men. And she, she was groomed. Unfortunately, today she's not in that role. But I think we still have hope that there are this, the youth of today, the women of today, who are very strong, very powerful, will, will be that dynamic change that's required, at least in Afghanistan, to, to change things. So we can only be hopeful as to what will happen. And I would like to echo all my fellow distinguished panelists and uh, uh, say that a very uh, sincere, genuine internal peace process is what is needed with the help of the international community. But here I would like to raise a, a precaution um, in terms of uh, in external, um, um, you know, external impacts um, uh, of uh, certain external actors, uh, such as China, uh, which is famous for uh, pursuing um, uh, unconditionality, actually, when it comes to dealing with regimes uh, who have poor human rights uh, track records. So uh, this really um, raises a lot of uh, red flags, actually, in terms of um, this, uh, you know, the Chinese government's involvement in the uh, in the uh, new regime uh, because uh, they are known for their uh, no conditions uh, approach uh, in uh, foreign policy when it comes to uh, implementation and having a good track record of uh, human rights principles so um, that really raises an important uh, flag here and uh, the important uh, thing to remember is to have a comprehensive and all-inclusive uh, 
a type of a peace process that is going to be, uh, you know, willing to listen to all sides concerns and willing to compromise, reach a compromise for a working solution. So thank you very much. I would again like to thank the panelists for taking the time to come speak with us and the audience members for participating in the event. Our next panel is in collaboration with Women in I.O. and will discuss the impacts of Taliban control on Afghan women. It will schedule for 3 o'clock and will still be held in Cabot 206 and on Zoom. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank, thank you. you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.